the reason, the main reason why I wanted to bring you on today, actually, we were going to discuss how do you hire your a successful remodeler or what, what tips uh, can you, do you have for our, for our listeners? On today's show, I have Jim Molinelli from the US. Jim, it's great to have you on. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. No problem. So whereabouts in the U.S. are you? I'm in a small town that's in between Baltimore, Maryland and Washington, D.C. on the East Coast. Okay. Okay. And what's the weather there like right now? Uh, We had 10 inches of snow over the weekend and it's cold. It's it's a bit like where I am. So that's good. So tell us a little bit about your background and uh, why we uh, put you uh, brought you on here today. All right. I am a licensed architect. I grew up wanting to be an architect and and only work on houses. Uh, So I went through school and I got a license and and began to work in the field. Ultimately got too many degrees. I ended up with a PhD somehow. But I found that education, uh, while I loved teaching, uh, wasn't my thing. I I loved working with the homeowner, uh, wanting to help them achieve their goals and improve their life. And the more that I worked with the homeowners in architecture, uh, the more passion I developed for that. So when I left with my PhD, rather than go back into an architecture office, I decided that since I had a fatal flaw that I had identified, it was being unable to work with the client budget and being having an inability to uh, estimate my work properly. I wanted to work in remodeling and learn to estimate. So I offered my design services to a local design build remodeling company if they would teach me to estimate and I got my feet wet and I found that I loved it. And so the last 25 years have been me doing design build remodeling, designing the architecture side and working with the client and then handing that off to the build team, uh, the remodeling team to uh, make it a reality. Brilliant. So, okay, there's so many things that we can actually speak about then. So First of all, let's start from the beginning. When, what, what made you want to go into this kind of industry? Because like you said, it was whenever, ever since you left school, right? What, what made uh, you do that? As a kid, I loved the idea of putting houses together and the logic of it and, and the way you would arrange them and seeing interesting shapes and sizes and, and asking myself, why did they do that? I always had a, an aptitude for the three-dimensional problem solving. And I found uh, there was nothing better. Uh, The first time you work with homeowners and they love their room, they love their addition, they love their remodel, you're hooked. There's nothing that you'd rather do than see people actually improve their life by working with you. And a a solution that you came up with and implemented has made them happy and made their life better and more productive. So uh, I, I was hooked from the first. Tell us um, of an interesting uh, remodel that you've had experience with in the past, something that's been quite amazing. One of the more interesting was uh, a, so a couple that I had in one of my classes. I teach classes to homeowners on how to prepare to remodel, and I did this at the uh, community college, the local community college. This couple sat through the course And when I got to the point where I explained what the different types of remodelers were and the options that individual homeowners had using a traditional remodeler along with an architect as a a team or using a design build firm, which included an architect and remodeler together. And the husband constantly told me, we don't know we're getting the best deal if we go with design build. So if we go with an architect and we put it out to bid, then we can compare prices and we know that I'm getting a fair price. I'm paying a fair price. And I said, you know, that's great. But if you get everything that's on your list, everything that you want to accomplish and they can do it for your price, then is that really problematic to work with one team? And he said, no, but I really wouldn't know if I'm overspending. Well, he chose after the course to go off and hire an architect and then turn those drawings over to a remodeler. Turns out that the architect he hired was a friend of mine, and when it came time for them to put a price to the project, I offered to help Tom put the price to the project and estimate it. The price was significantly higher for the scope of work than what the budget was. 
which is not uncommon with architects because we're not taught to estimate. We don't understand exactly what those prices will be the same way that the remodeling contractors do. And so they found that that was extreme. Uh, they wanted to spend about $700,000 and they were being asked to spend a million and two. And so they fired him. And uh, they came back to me and said, would you be our architect? I said, no, I'm, I'm doing design build remodeling and, and you can hire me for no charge if you come in with you know, the, the team. And they said, okay, well come talk to us. And I had to come up with a completely new solution for them, of course, because they didn't have the rights to the solution that was provided by the architect, my friend. So I came up with a new solution for the whole home remodel and we implemented it for them. And uh, we, our portion of it was about $450,000. And then they direct paid for a number of other pieces, the total of which ended up being about 750,000. So it was right in line with the budget yeah. that they gave and a very exciting design. The thing that moved me the most about it was we were standing in the new master suite one day, just looking at the, the vistas and the tall ceilings and, and, and he was, saying, this is a remarkable transformation, how you can do this. He said, if you ever need somebody to come into your course and sing the praises of working with an architect in a design build situation, you let me know, I'm your guy. He yeah, said, two days ago, I asked you if we could have windows overlooking the backyard from here, and now we have a dormer with windows overlooking the backyard. Being able to see it in three dimensions and then make a modification and have somebody that's willing to work with you. He said, what, a, what an amazing benefit. So that kind of a thing where you see a couple that wants to age in place and build a, a, a stair tower and keep their home out in the woods, but they, they had to put an elevator in and they had to put a whole house generator to power it. But they ended up with a spectacular piece of architecture and a solution which made the next 15 or 20 years of their life uh, a dream. So Amazing. And where, do you have uh, any pictures of the work that maybe we could share? You can look it up on house. Yes, I would be happy to get you some. Excellent. Fantastic. So, okay. So then that's pretty much the setup of what you do. So... Tell me, how, how big are, are, is your team? Like, how difficult is it to find suitable contractors to, to represent you? Well, I actually, <laughs> I've moved on. I've retired. I, I did this for 30 years. And yeah. uh, a year ago, I stopped doing just designed build work. And I have focused almost exclusively on educating homeowners. And my mission is to help them get prepared identify the players in the field, all the professionals that they might want to choose from, pick mm -hmm. the ones that are the best fit for their project, and then how to work with them and negotiate with them to get a successful project. And that's the umbrella of, of work that I'm doing. To say that I do no design would, would be a, a falsehood. I, I still have an, a client or two come up to me, and I love the challenge of the three-dimensional problem solving, but I... I tired of the paperwork end of uh, the field work end of the, the process. <laughs> what was it like then? So back, back then when you were doing it, how difficult oh. was it to get contractors to do the work to implement it? Well, the lovely thing in a design build situation, uh, which really came from commercial work initially, architects and contractors are typically contractually opposite one another. The owner is in between them and they are partnered with the architect, but the contractor is the enemy. Uh, so that's the traditional method. And a, a bunch of wise, rich men who build buildings decided we, we have to eliminate that controversy and we want to put these guys on the same side, on the same team. And so they put an architect team together with the contractors so that the initial designs could be properly estimated the projects could be compressed in terms of time and cost savings could be realized. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing now exists here for the remodeling public. You can go to a design build firm. Many of them are phony. Mm -hmm. they, they call themselves design build because it's a catchy phrase and they want everybody to say, hey, choose me. But the idea that you can put an architect or a design team together with a contractor under one umbrella, under one roof, at your direction, 
is a wonderful thing because you get a cooperative sense then of the design and the construction. The firm that I worked on, we specialized in projects that started about seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars and went up. In other words, projects for which that you, you would consider using a, an architect in the first place. Sure. Yeah. Very large kitchens or parts of kitchens as an addition, uh, two-story additions, multiple room additions, whole house remodels, things like that. And the team had four or five dedicated foremen, and we ran four or five projects at a time. We had a regular set of subcontractors, the same electricians and plumbers that we used on all of the projects. And I was the first contact for the clients. So I was the salesman, but I wasn't a salesman. I was an architect. And so I would go in and try to delve into what's your problem? How are we going to solve it? What do you really need? Will this arrangement work? Because a lot of times a homeowner may suggest something which they think will work, but you can come up with something that may be improved upon. So I would do that and I would have the initial consultation with them and work with them to sort of figure out what the plan of attack was to solve their problem. Come up with an initial sketch and a, and a based on their budget, estimate whether or not that scope of work could be performed for their budget. If mm -hmm. we believed it could, we would get together and, and sign an agreement and uh, go forward as a team. It, it was lovely. And then we just have a great big production meeting uh, where I would hand off the design side to the production team with both sides and the homeowners present. I suppose it's a lot better than just uh, the homeowner hire and a building contractor, because when you fall into that situation, I'm sure you've come across this before, but if the builder is trying to explain something to the homeowner uh, about why this has to be a certain way or why it's going to be this, this much more, it can get quite sensitive and maybe stressful at, at the same time. But by having yourself in, in the middle, you're kind of a blessing in disguise for, for the builder because you're educated in, in, the, in the industry, you know what you're talking about, and you're also there to sensitively deliver that information to the client, right? I, I agree completely. Um, the architect looks at projects from a different perspective. He looks at them from, are we meeting the client's need perspective? And mm -hmm. not just how are we gonna do it and what will it cost? Or how do we get this job like the salesman would look at it? So if you're not solving a need, then what am I doing? And, and many times clients are confused. When they call, they have an idea, but they haven't thought the idea all the way through, correct? Yeah, yeah. And if they call three remodelers, by the time they've met with the third one, they have a whole bunch of new ideas. And so the project that each of those remodelers are planning or pricing for them are very different many times. So I would go out and I would try to sit with them and just be friendly and say, what are you trying to accomplish? Don't tell me how big you want the room. Don't tell me where you want the room. Just tell me what you're going to do in it, what you need it, how you need it to perform, and uh, all the parameters that you can possibly think of that define the solution, but without creating the solution or giving me the solution. Mm -hmm. And that way I would know if I'm truly meeting their needs with something I came up with. So how was it when you were dealing with clients in terms of budget realization? Did they, did they approach you with realistic budgets or completely on the other side kind of thing? The, the complete gamut. You'd have people that had an appropriate amount of money for what they were asking. You'd have people who have no concept. But I don't worry about that because I have to come up with a scope of work. And my preference was to always work with the client on define the project. What are you trying to accomplish? What's the full range of what you'd like to do? And mm. I would talk about it logically and break it down and put the parameters together and then say, okay, now how much do you want to spend to make that happen? And they would say, well, I don't know what it costs. And I'd say, no, 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 I know what it costs. What do you want to spend to make that happen? And that's the difference between price and budget. And the mm. homeowner generally is unaware of that. Mm. I tell you what it will cost. You tell me what you want to spend. And we try to find a way to match your need or your request, your scope of work with your price. And if it doesn't line up, then I would say, we can't accomplish everything that you've asked for that price. So yeah. do we want to increase the budget or do we want to redefine the scope of work 
so that we can make a good match and, and, and cr create a project that, that you'll be happy with. This is the difference between that model and going to an architect first and then putting the project out to bid, finding out that it has run over budget, then having to go back to the architect, get it redesigned, then putting it back out for more bids and then value engineering it. Mm. When you get a price that's 50% too high, as you well know, the project is, is unfeasible. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. You can't take 25% out of an overpriced project. It, as you pull out the features that bring the price down, you've pulled the life out of the solution. And so the customer feels like I, they bought into the dream and now the dream has been ripped to shreds. Mm. There's nothing left. I prefer to work the other way and to try to redefine the scope at the beginning and try to match it to a budget that is realistic so that they can actually embark on a journey that gets them where they want to go. It can be quite tough sometimes as well, trying to handle uh, the budgets. Yeah. And uh, having no budget, you know, oh, what is your budget? I haven't really got a budget. So like, how does that work? Well, you know, humor I found to be the best way. When I began in the field, uh, I looked at all those zeros on the end of our prices and, and it, it bothered me. For You know, I'd have sleepless nights. Why are we asking for that much money for this project? Um, but I ended up understanding that that was part of the business. And in order mm. to stay in business, there needed to be an overhead and a profit. And so be it. So I learned to laugh at money. And I'd like to make the client laugh. So when they would say, well, I have no idea what it costs. I'd say, fine, well, you've just described this project. and You've told me what you want it to be. Mm. Would you rather pay 10000 or 110000 for that? And they would laugh and they'd say, well, I'd rather play closer to 10000 <laughs> And And I say, well, you can't get it for that. And they say, well, how about 25000 I say, no, can't get it for that either. I say, you're going to be closer to sixty or seventy or 80000 and they go, oh, well, I was hoping for 60. I go, okay, now we know where the now budget we know. is. Now, exactly. now we're there. So here's what we can do for 60. Is that going to be enough to meet your need? Are you okay with that scope of work? And they would say yes, or they would say, well, maybe a little bit more because I want that other thing. Okay, now, but that's how I would do it. I would, I would play, the, play their game and act ignorant and, and explain the difference between budget and, and, and price. And, and uh, we, we'd try to get them where they were comfortable. Brilliant. The reason, the main reason why I wanted to bring you on today, actually, we were going to discuss how do you hire your a successful remodeler or what, what tips uh, can you, do you have for our, for our listeners? Today, I'd like to discuss four simple tips or four simple categories that you want to consider when you're looking at a remodel. And, and these four will make sure that what you're asking for and what they provide are a good match. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the first thing that anybody needs to know is they've got to get themselves squared away. They really do have to understand what are you trying to accomplish? What does the project have to do to be a successful project? And that's very different for everybody. And I'm not talking about what does it need to cost? I'm not talking about, does it, does the kitchen need to have a stove? but really to, to understand what are the absolute minimum needs that it must meet in order for it to become a viable project. If you can't perform A, B, C, D, and E, then I'm not going to sign because I can't get enough for my money. Okay, yeah. so that, that preparatory work has to be done. But if the customer knows what they want, these four things will help them find the right person to help them achieve it. So let and, me, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So let me just hold you there then. Okay. So it's what do they want? They need to know what they want. So would it be beneficial that they would need to speak to several remodelers first before they define what they really want? Cause they might have hundreds of ideas. So it's having the initial chats before. What do you think? You know, 30 years ago, I would have said a different answer. Today, I would say, no, actually, you're wasting your time and the remodeler's time to call them out prematurely mm -hmm. because they will steer you in the direction they want to go and take control of your project. The only person who knows what fails about your current home, whether that's the whole home or whether that's the bathroom or whether that's the kitchen, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. The only person who knows what fails to meet your need is you. And the only person who knows what will meet your need is you. So yeah. if you can put together a list of needs, it must do this, it must have that, 
I would like it to include this also. I want to cook this way. I want to have this view. I want this kind of seating. It's not a solution. It's just the component building parts. And that's what I call the need list. It, every project has one and they're indisputable, must have needs. If you have that list and sort of an elevator pitch that says the, the sort of big description of what you're trying to accomplish. I want to tear it apart and I want to put it back together in a new way with this kind of seating and that kind of cooking and these types of materials. That's it. The details can be supplied by other people at a later date. Okay. The contractors come in with a great deal of expertise in materials and methods and they can help you accomplish whatever you want in a very clever way. And the architects and designers can help you dress it up very gorgeously, right? Yeah, so yeah. Rely on the experts for what they're expert at, but only you know what will make your project a success. How do you Maybe. like to live? How do you like to cook? How do you like to bathe? Those questions nobody else can answer. I guess so. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down to like the colors and the textures and the layout, maybe some ideas, oh, inspirational yes. things like Pinterest can help people, right? So, oh, absolutely. There's yeah. nothing wrong with gathering ideas. House and Pinterest are terrific for seeing yeah. wonderful vistas and ideas and colors and combinations that you never imagined. Yeah. And by all means, consider those things. If you're doing a kitchen, you need to have a look of cabinet in mind. You need to have a, a door style or a type. You may want a particular countertop. Those are great. And you'll have a lot of fun shopping for those and talking about those and de debating the merits of those later. But there are experts in the field and your remodelers and their help can definitely tune you in and, and, and keep you on budget and give you the options that are available. But yeah, that, it's wonderful to dream that way. People sometimes just don't know what's available, which is why I prefer them not to try to solve the problem because they're sure. not space planners. They're not three-dimensional thinkers usually. So if they say, I'd like a sunroom addition, I'd say, okay, well, that didn't really narrow it down, did it? So let's figure out what sunroom means to you. Is there going to be seating in it? Oh, yes, we're going to have maybe six or seven adults at a time. Are you going to eat in that room? Oh, no, we're not going to eat. This is for TV viewing. Okay, there's a television. Well, that tells me I need a piece of solid wall. Do we have a view? Oh, it's in the back of the house, and I love the view to the trees. Great, so windows are going in that direction. You know, and, and we, if you tell me what you want to accomplish in the room, I can help you make the room just great for that. Yeah. But if the homeowner says, I'd like a 10 by 20 room with windows on three sides, they've tied my hands. And I don't know yeah. if the solution will be a great solution. Mm -hmm. But if they tell me what they want to accomplish, I can help. Good. Okay. So the four tips. <laughs> yes. The four <laughs> tips. Um, you want to ver verify the basic credentials of anybody that you're going to consider. And this is before you call them, before you invite them to your house. You want to do some homework and make sure that they are the right people. Second is get somebody with some experience because experience pays dividends. Third is work with the best specialist that you can in the field that you are about to do. So if you're going to do a bathroom, you want people that really are great at bathrooms. You will work working a kitchen. You want people that have done a few kitchens before. If you're doing a large addition or a whole home remodel, you want people that, that do that type and size of project all the time. And the fourth one is make a perfect match. You want to match your budget to their average project size. And if you mm. can do that as the fourth item, then you've got somebody who is right up your alley. And I'd be happy to elaborate on that. In fact, I have written up a, a, a short paper on this that I'll be happy to give to all of your listeners if they want to log on the website later and download it. Absolutely. Good. Brilliant. And we can put that on the blog actually as a link and we can send it to your website too. Terrific. Um, so let's just go through them again. So the verification remodelers. Basically, you want to make sure that you're dealing with a professional. In many jurisdictions, they have to be licensed or registered or they have to be members of an association or uh, have a credential. And the first thing that you should do is be aware of that and make sure that the people that are required to be licensed or registered, in fact, are and that that license or registration is current. You want to make sure that they are qualified to do the exact work that they do, and they don't just have a business license or a truck with a sign. You really want people that are truly qualified. So let's see, uh, you, you want to make sure that they have the right insurance. 
they need to carry liability insurance, which protects you and your project and your home in the event that they have an error. They need, in many cases, here in the States anyway, to have workers' compensation insurance so that if there is an injury on site, their people are taken care of. And the third type of insurance, which really has nothing to do with your contractor, is you want to make sure your homeowner's insurance is up to date. And in fact, if you're doing a large project, raise the covered value of your home as you start the job so that anything that happens at home is also covered. So those are some things you want to make sure that anybody you're dealing with is legal and above board. You want to make sure that they pull any permits and they get any required inspections and they don't try to skirt the law. So you're really just making sure that they jump through the right hoops and that they they have all the right coverages and and, uh, meet a certain minimum level of qualifying. You already mentioned about the insurance that the homeowner should have uh, and this is like increasing it if they're having a remodel. So just calling them and notifying them that they're going to be having some work done yeah. uh, over a certain period of time. Okay. Yeah. If you're putting $60,000 into your house or a hundred thousand dollars into your house, you probably didn't have it insured for that total. So you might yeah. as well call and say, I'd like to raise the coverage on the policy to this new level so that if cool. anything ever happens, you're covered right away. Okay. What was the next tip? Uh, The next tip is experience pays dividends. I want them to only work with people that are truly experienced. Uh, Would you rather deal with somebody who's got a 10 or 15 year record at doing the type of project that you're looking for or somebody who started last week? Mm. And the answer is you'd really like to work with the experienced person. My experience says that if a company in this industry gets past about six or seven years, they're established. They've got a routine, they understand their niche, they have the cash flow kind of worked out, and, and they're not teetering on the brink of disappearing. And that's the first and most important <laughs> thing. You want to make sure that they're in this for the, for the long haul, and uh, that if they do a great job on this, that they can become your go-to people. And the other thing that experience brings is clarity and understanding. They're, they're better at problem solving because they've seen more problems and they've solved more problems. They're better at estimating because they have a good idea what's behind the walls and they've seen it a few times. They've run into just about every goof and and snag and problem that can come up in doing renovations. Uh, So that experience comes to bear in many ways, a more accurate price and a more accurate construction process. That is not to say nothing will go wrong with an experienced remodeler. Something goes wrong on every project, but it's how they handle that and the ease with which they handle that, that you're buying when you get experienced people. I would argue the fact that you're probably going to end up paying a premium for someone that is experienced because they've been around for a lot longer and they know how to do it. So it's a bit more like if, you, if, you, if you're going to hire a lawyer and the lawyer has got 20 years experience and very successful projects and everything behind them or cases in this in this case you, I, I always think that you're going to be a pr- uh, having to pay more of a premium but i think that's worth it because there's less that can go wrong or less risk yes if the more money that you're putting into your project the more risk you are taking it is a gamble that is not to say it is like going to a casino and and, and putting your money on red or black it's not a 50 50 mm. proposition but if you hire the wrong remodeler What can go wrong? Well, they can be sloppy, they can be slow, they can make errors, they can default. Those are the bad side. If you hire the right remodeler, you're probably not going to be error-free, but you're probably going to be stress-free and pain-free, and you're probably gonna be a much more accurate price. You don't wanna get halfway in and find out what the fault was with the estimate. You don't wanna get halfway in and find out that the remodeler didn't have all the experience you had hoped they had. You you know, if you're doing something and and they've done it a thousand times before, don't worry whether your project will challenge them. It probably won't. But that's okay because they are in business to do precisely what it is that you're trying to have done. That's their reason for existing. And that's what they want. So hire that person and, and take the benefit of that. You don't want to gamble with a large sum. If you're doing a hallway bathroom for seven or eight thousand dollars, you know, fine, you can do it. Your neighbor can do it. The handyman can do it. The guy down the street can do it. 
because you're pulling parts out and putting them back together. And we've seen it a thousand times on television. And yeah. the worst trouble you get in is you call somebody and for the same seven or $8,000, they'll come in and mop up behind you. But if you're doing a, a 70000 or a $270,000 project, that gamble is one that you can't dig out of. It'll cost you two or three times that price to fix it if it goes wrong. Absolutely. So it pays to do it right and find the right person. It's very rare that you find a contractor willingly to fix someone else's work in the first place. Correct. You also so, pay for that privilege. Yeah, you do. You do. And yeah, just to talk a little bit more about the inexperience, like this is where they can really have the risk or you can run the risk of, of them under, way underestimating what the project's going to cost but they won't find that out until they're midway through and they've run out of money. And then you're stuck in a position whether you need to hire someone else or they need to stop the work and try to get the money elsewhere to finish your project off. That topic is, is touchy and is yeah. probably worthy of an entire uh, <laughs> episode, but, but sure. the, the risk of the low price is, is a big risk. Yeah. Uh, but, but if you've qualified your remodeler, you know that they do, a lot of that project and they do mm. it all the time. They, they do it very well. You've checked references, you've seen the work, you've visited a job and you've done your work and you know that the project's a good success. Then, then that partnership generally avoids the issue of, of major mistakes. It's the person that comes in at the very, very low price who has made an error in their estimating or mm -hmm. in their tactical. They, they made an omission. Maybe they put a, a room above the house. They added on up there, but they forgot to raise the chimney. You know, So it's a $1,200 or an $1,800 mason bill that they forgot. Or they, they made a te uh, just a technical error. What if they, they put $1,000 and they meant to put 10,000 for the HVAC work? And what happens when they figure that out and you're a month into the project and they come to you and say, oh, we made a terrible mistake. It's going to be nine thousand more dollars. <laughs> yeah, you, no one you know, wants to hear that. The experience is really what what avoids that. Y you get what you pay for, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. And and it's a shame, but if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. And if mm -hmm. you want somebody who's reputable, you you pay for that value. If something that Juliet said in a former episode resonated with me, she said. If your life was on the line and you were facing a courtroom, you know, would you want the bargain lawyer or would yeah. you want the highest paid defense lawyer you could afford? Yeah, sure. And and while your life's not on the line, your house is on the line and your family yeah. security is on the line. And so the more valuable the project, yes, you want to work with a better and better contractor as you spend more. I mean, not to sound too drastic, but it could mean your life is on the line. If you're installing gas, <laughs> if you're, <laughs> or the, you get the electrics wrong, it could end up meaning the- Or structures. Yeah, all the structures, yeah. yeah. Okay, so next tip, we're on the third. All right, choose experts and specialists. Many remodelers in the United States are, are jack of all trades. They do everything. Right. And if you look at any website, you're going to see we specialize in uh, decks and basements and kitchens and bathrooms and roofing and siding and windows and, and saunas and, and uh, every other thing under the sun. And the simple fact is that's not true. Anybody who specializes in everything doesn't specialize in anything. And uh, even those who are experts at a, a particular item or two tend to over advertise because they really do want to keep busy and, and, and bring in a lot of work. But you can break it down and you can find out what they do a preponderance of. If 50% of their projects involve kitchens, then they're a great kitchen company. Yeah. If 60% uh, of their projects involve bathrooms, then when you've got a bathroom to do, they're trustworthy. And then there are specialists. There truly are specialists. There are in the U.S. anyway. There are kitchen and bath specialists who do nothing but kitchens and baths. Mm. And who knows more about the parts and pieces of kitchens and baths than somebody who's working on them every day of the year. So the problems that come up in these different types of projects are well known to the people who do them regularly. And the, the more specialized these people are, the more in touch they are with the good and the bad things to do. And they can guide you both in design and material selection and product selection. And they generally have their finger on the pulse of what makes an interesting design and can help you in that regard too. So I do believe that you want to look for experts. 
and not work with generalists anytime that's affordable. So I'm just trying to, to picture someone that's got a remodeler in their home. Maybe they are focusing on the bathroom and the kitchen. And it's that time of year where they're, they're think, the homeowner's thinking, maybe I want to actually do some of the, the garden outside, uh, the, the lawn outside, whatever. So they would more than likely say to their existing remodeler, hey, can you, can you do this? Can you price for this work? And uh, most remodelers would not turn down any additional work, so <laughs> they would probably say yes. But they might not necessarily be the best. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate sometimes, I've actually known that myself, when everything is going so well, and then when you give it a little bit more, and they say yes to that too, and it, that goes wrong, it destroys the rest of the project, and it really leaves a sort of sour taste in the mouth. That's true. From the production side of things, uh, when you've come in on budget and you've done everything you said you would do and they're happy, 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 and then some glitch comes up when they're painting the trim or nailing in the final piece of trim or uh, a plumber comes back for a touch-up and leaves a, a can of uh, pipe mend on their white appliance and it has a purple ring. You know, the whole thing can unravel so quickly. So yeah, it's dangerous. But to your first point, yes, if you can work with somebody who does the thing that you're getting done and they do it all the time, they're likely to be not only forming it and designing it, but probably pricing it too. Mm. And in reality, while some specialists cost more because they believe their own press clippings, many specialists cost less than a generalist. In other words, for you to do a specific set of steel stairs or a, a landscape project, if you are a construction guy, or you know you just do residential construction, those are outside your expertise. So if that if you go and find somebody who's an expert at hardscapes, they're going to price it better, they're going to produce it quicker and with less trouble, and probably do it for less in the end. Yeah. So you, you get a better job whenever you can work with people who do that phase of the work all day in, the time. day out. Yeah. Okay. And what's the last tip? The last one is to make a perfect match. And this is something that I've never seen anybody else really bring to light. And that is if, if I can match my budget to their average project size. So I already know they do a lot of kitchens or bathrooms or whatever it is that I'm asking for. So if I've got, 35,000 to spend on a master bath and their average project size is 150,000. That's a mismatch. Mm. If I've got 75,000 to spend on an upscale kitchen and, and their average project size is $30,000, that's a mismatch. But if I'm doing a nice kitchen at $50,000 and their average project size is 55, I've got somebody who does the exact thing that I want to do and they're the right size project. You see, companies will do a lot of different projects, but there usually is a range that is their bread and butter. They're really efficient at it, and they're really good at it, and they produce it quickly and accurately, and they leave good, happy customers behind. That's what you're looking for. So how do you get this information is really the trick, because people won't tell you. What's no. your average project size? No, they don't, they don't want to tell you that because that, that pigeonholes them. And, and then if you're too low or too high, you're going to go somewhere else, right? Yeah. But what will a remodeler answer if you say, how many projects a year do you do? Oh, well, we do 40, you know? Oh, great. Well, what's your annual revenue? Oh, we do $2 million a year. Well, great. Well, now you know their average project. <laughs> because they're boasting <laughs> when they're answering those questions, but they'll give you the information you need. Mm. And then you'll know. See, I had a recent client, a student client, who wanted to put a second floor on a, a ranch house in, in Minnesota. And they said, well, how do we find somebody who's an expert at that? And I said, well, the first thing is, what's your budget? And they said, we want to spend about X. And I said, well, then you need somebody who does a lot of projects at that price point. You know, you don't want to find somebody who does kitchens for a living, but is willing to take on a second floor. You want somebody who does $200,000 projects whether they do one at a time or whether they do three at a time doesn't matter, but each of their projects falls in that 150 to 300 price range so that you know that they know all of the intricacies of this. So that's the goal here is to match your budget, whatever amount you are able and willing to spend to their typical project size. 
you already know they do what you do. You already know they're pre-qualified. Now you know that they have a pretty good likelihood of coming in at your budget price. You've got yourself a good pool of talent now, and you can perform interviews with these folks and really pick based on the nuances, the quality of the, the design that they're talking about, or the rapport that you build with them, or uh, maybe you've met a customer or two when you've been doing your referral checks and you've seen a job that was just amazing and you realize that you know that's who you want to go with so it'll it frees you up to really pick based on how you feel about the the rapport and the and the work that they'll do for you and not have to worry about these technical aspects you put them behind you yeah yeah lots and lots of advice there can we just summarize on the on the tips themselves again sure. Yep. Uh, the, the four are that you want to verify the credentials, which include any licensing, registration, insurances, and, and uh, willingness to obtain permits and inspections. All the things, the little ticky-tacky legal things and, and protection things that you want to make sure are in place before you begin. Sure. Second, experience pays. You want people that have been in business for six or seven years or longer, just so that they're past that sort of entrepreneurial business hurdle. You don't want them to be teetering on the brink financially. Yeah. Uh, you want them to be solid, have all the connections with their subs and in, in, within the industry so that you're getting somebody who, who knows what they're doing. And you want to work with experts and specialists whenever possible instead of generalists because they are more familiar with what you're having done. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if they don't have the broadest range of skills, they're expert at that thing. They're not going to overlook details and they perform it all the time. They really know uh, what's going to happen day in and day out. So it's a good bet. And then you want to try to match the best you can, the perfect match between your budget and their ideal project or typical project so that you're getting somebody who's exactly what you need. Perfect. Tell us a little bit about your website again. What's its purpose? And tell, tell everyone where they can find you. The website is jimmolinelli.com. And you can go there and see what I offer. I have a number of uh, informational pieces that are for homeowners. My whole goal anymore is to educate the homeowner about the remodeling process and make them smarter, better consumer of remodeling. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to uh, plan a project, get yourself prepared, that information is there. If you're looking for a class, I offer a class online called uh, Remodeling Success Blueprint, which helps educate you about the process from concept to contract. And uh, so that's what they'll see if they go there. There are some uh, little pieces, uh, little videos and uh, little, little uh, downloads that they can get. But it's, it's all about remodeling education for the homeowner. Fantastic. And we can get you on again to do another episode all about contractors themselves, I'm sure. Uh, yes. If, if you want to uh, pick another topic or branch off, I'd, I'd be happy to visit with you. Amazing. Jim, it's really nice to have you on. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a blast. <laughs> no problem. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah? I will. You too. Thank you. Thanks.